Giving back and leaving a place better than you found it, that is what gamekeeping is all about. As hunters and fishermen, we're rewarded in our time in nature, shining a light on fascinating aspects of wildlife and the best management practices will help us all to be better outdoorsmen while giving back to nature and the wildlife that we love so much. Armed with a deeper understanding, we are gamekeepers. The Gamekeepers of Mossy Oak is presented by Rocksore Mission Ready and in association with Tractor Supply Company for life out here. Why did they gobble yesterday and they're not gobbling today? Why do they just gobble in the afternoon? Why do they hit the ground and not say anything? You think you know, you think they're within, but you don't know what happened since you put them to bed the night before, whether a coyote spent the night under the tree, you don't know. So when they don't say anything in the morning, your mind gets to wondering, okay, did they leave? More than likely, they're around there somewhere. They just decided not to gobble for any number of reasons. It's that unknown that keeps you going back to try to be successful, and, and the only way to conquer the unknown is to go over and over and over again. That's why after about a 40 day season, we're all walking around like zombies because we're all turkey tired because you just got to keep going. I don't know what really sets turkeys apart from everything else for a lot of us. We love going and hearing them gobble and watching the morning wake up every spring morning. It's like an addiction. We just keep wanting to go back. The wild turkey, it's kind of one of those things that's hard to explain to somebody that's not a turkey hunter about why they drive us crazy. Here at Mossy Oak, I'd say it's probably our number one species we all love to chase the most. They're just magical, flat out. I like turkey hunting just because it's a chase. That chess match and knowing when to call, knowing when not to call, and the right setup, and being where the turkey wants to be. To me, it all boils down to that magical moment. I always call it getting him inside the breadbasket. When he walks up there and you know that he's going to be in range and you're going to have an opportunity to take him home in the back of the truck, just the excitement and the crescendo of that moment year after year, plus all the times when they gobble behind you and your hair stands up and you wrap all that together, it's just, to me, the excitement of culmination of that challenge when you come down to that defining moment. The turkeys gobble most immediate reason is to attract hens. They're gobbling during the breeding season. They're wanting to secure as many mates as they can. That first gobble at sunrise, particularly the very first morning that you get to go, it's just like the start of a race. Or maybe it's an owl that fires him up and you hear him respond to that owl call. It's something that's really hard to put into words until you've been there and it doesn't get old. Every season I go, you still look forward to hearing that very first gobble of the year. When you're sitting up against a tree and just starting to break daylight and then hearing that turkey, whether it be close or far, just the adrenaline just starts pumping and hearing the woods wake up, hearing that turkey gobble from a tree limb, I mean, there's nothing like it. That's when you know the, the game started. That old adage that hunters have that you can tell a jake by its gobble or you can tell an older bird by its gobble, you know, there's some generality there, but I don't know that it's always 100% true. Likewise, I've heard turkeys gobble soft, a gobbler that maybe has been pressured from hunters or maybe he is just a subdominant bird in the area. You know, they can kind of lower the tone of their gobble where they're gobbling a little bit soft, maybe not trying to draw as much attention to themselves. You know, when you're sitting there for 30 minutes, you can still hear your motor kind of clanking a little bit. You start hearing the cardinals, and then, you know, you may hear a dove or something, and then you hear that distant turkey. It just all of a sudden goes from just being deathly quiet to hearing that roar way off, and it just fires you up. Stay connected with Gamekeepers on both Facebook and Instagram.
The strutting is more of the visual cue that the gobbler is giving off to the hens. They're strutting to sort of show their fitness to the hens. And we know from a lot of different research, there are some selection that goes on in terms of the hens selecting for certain traits in the gobblers and sort of visually sizing them up and deciding this is going to be the, the guy that fathers my offspring. In the spring, when they are in strut, particularly if the sunlight's hitting them, and it's making all those iridescent colors in their feathers pop out and their heads changing colors, and you can see the tail fan. It's something you can't drive by in a field and not stop and look at. It doesn't get old looking at it. You have to watch it. It's a show. We do know from some work done here in Mississippi that hens are able to assess the health of a male. They can see different spectrums of light than humans can, so they can see a little bit more into the ultraviolet spectrum than we can. The UV reflectance a gobbler gives off is a very good indication of his health. There's been studies that have related the degree of that reflectance back to internal gut parasite loads. So a hen, in a sense, can see a gobbler with a certain aura about him and realize that, hey, that guy right there probably has fewer parasites, so that must mean he's healthier. <laughs> Sometimes you forget you're even hunting, you know, you're just sitting there watching the turkey out in front of you starting to strut and spitting and drumming and there's nothing like it. There's not a prettier sight in the woods than a turkey coming in full strut. Within a flock, there's going to be a very well established hierarchy. And then between flocks, there's going to be a hierarchy. So in a given area, you know, you may have multiple groups of gobblers. There will be a dominant bird within each group. And then between groups, they will recognize dominance. We do know that Generally speaking, within a turkey population, the actual mating is only going to be done by a relatively small number of males. That one dominant male that's doing a lot of the mating, he may have another subordinate bird or two that hang with him, but they probably are, are related to him, maybe a direct sibling from the same nest that he's been with his whole life, and they basically are trying to help him secure hens so that his genes can be passed on to the next generation, which if they're a sibling, that means their genes are being passed on. A lot of times they get close and they'll kind of hang up out of shooting range and they start strutting and they make this crazy drumming noise. And you'll see them just pop into strut and start doing this and you're having to be dead calm and your breathing gets harder and, and you look over and your kid's doing this and then you realize you're doing the same thing. It's just crazy. That's what we love so much about it. So the drumming is a way, just like with a gobble, it's a way of attracting hens. It's a way of doing it at more of a closer range. And that low frequency of the drum, it's an odd sound in that if you're really close to it, sometimes it's difficult to tell exactly where it's coming from. It'll sound like it's coming from all directions at once. Particularly in like a heavily forested area, that low frequency sound probably travels through the woods farther than we would like to think. And I think it's a way of being a sort of up close attraction to the females that doesn't necessarily give away his exact location because it's so hard to pinpoint drumming. So from a predation standpoint, you're able to advertise and without calling so much attention that a bobcat or coyote or something's gonna pinpoint exactly where you are the way that goblin would. <laughs> So a drumming turkey to me is, it's almost like the final step before something's fixing to happen. A lot of times it might be right before the trigger gets pulled or right before they bust you. It's a very low frequency and when you've heard it once, you'll never mistake it again for anything else. You're like, oh, that's a turkey drumming. When you hear it, you cannot move. You better not blink. Don't shift your gun because usually when you hear them drumming, they're in killing range. I can still remember where I was the very first time that I heard it several years before Marcel got started and I heard that drumming. At the time, I really didn't know what it was. It's just a very special sound and, and then obviously to see one strut, whether you're up close or far away, when you really can hear them strut and drum and hear them make that <laughs> noise, I mean, it, it just puts goosebumps on you. No matter how many times you hear it, see it, it always makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up. The Gamekeepers of Mossy Oak is brought to you by Mossy Oak Brand Camo, Mossy Oak Native Nurseries, Mossy Oak Properties, Mossy Oak Biologic, Furminator, B&W Trailer Hitches, Spartan Cameras, Browning Firearms, Loopholes, Apex Ammunition, The Gamekeepers Magazine, and Gamekeepers Fieldware. 
Hey, to take your gamekeeping to the next level with up-to-date news and tips, scan the QR code on the screen. There's not a network across the country more qualified and trusted in helping folks buy or sell land than Mossy Oak Properties. To find your favorite place, talk to the land specialist at Mossy Oak Properties or visit mossyoakproperties.com. When you're thinking about turkeys, you're always thinking about diversity of habitat. So creating that nesting habitat, creating that brood rearing habitat and roosting habitat, and then also creating that cover habitat as well. If you can create a landscape of diversity, you can better manage your turkey populations and you could have more robust turkey populations. Here in Mississippi, you know, when we start, you know, you're still largely dealing with winter flocks. At some point within the first two weeks of our season, those flocks start kind of fragmenting. You may go from a flock of 12 or 15 hens with three gobblers down to three or four hens over here and three or four hens over there, and each of those has a gobbler with them. Once the breeding part of the season takes place, here in Mississippi is gonna be right around April the 1st. The hens start going off to nest every day. They lay one egg per day, and they're gonna do that until their entire clutch is laying, and then the hen will begin incubating at that time. Some of the things that are facing turkeys today always comes to mind when you're a biologist is habitat destruction. Whether that's urbanization or natural events, it's bringing back that habitat. So when you're thinking about nesting habitat, you're thinking about a little bit thicker habitat, post-burn about three years. When the hens go to nest, once they start incubating, they're generally they're going to sit on the nest for 28 straight days. Sometimes they don't leave the nest for several days. They're all going to hatch at about the same time. Even though she's laying only one a day, the development of the embryo is kind of arrested until she starts incubating and warms them all up to the same temperature. That's why even though egg number one and egg number 10 were laying 10 days apart, they're still going to hatch at about the same time. When they're really young, they're looking for protein sources. Insects are mostly what they're trying to get because they want that protein to be able to grow strong. Turkey young are called precocial, which means they're able to leave the nest relatively immediately and go forage and feed themselves. But they can't fly you know, somewhere between 10 days and two weeks. During that two week period, they are extremely susceptible to predators like bobcats and coyotes and even raccoons will eat poults. At that stage, they're really susceptible to a lot of birds of prey, which that's really the only time period where a lot of hawks will factor into mortality. When you're looking at brood rearing habitat, you're thinking about mostly open fields, burns within one to two years, and you're looking for that early successional habitat, so the forbs, legumes, native grasses that are there that harbor those insect populations. Turkey brood habitat is really important and is usually one of the most limiting factors on the landscape. So that's low, lush, herbaceous growth that's going to have a lot of insects and it's going to offer concealment to the poults. Generally, the hen's going to try to go find that. The more she has to search for that, the lower the survival of the poults will be. Once she finds that place that has good brood habitat, their movements are going to be pretty restricted. You know, they may only move around a 20 or 40 acre area. And then after about two weeks, you know, they get the ability to fly and their survival starts going up pretty dramatically after that. When they first get to fly, they can't fly really well, so it's important to have sort of low scrubby stuff as habitat because that's the type of stuff that they're able to flutter up to to get off the ground at night to get away from predators. They can't quite fly all the way to the top of a big 75-foot pine tree. That type of habitat, that shrub scrub kind of stuff can be really important during that short phase in the life of the poults. Creating and improving new brooding and nesting habitat can make a major difference in how often turkeys want to use a piece of property and how long they stay on that piece of property through the entire season. Creating areas that are almost patchwork, food plots, timber, young timber stands, fallow fields, using these and almost making a checkerboard of a piece of property can really improve the amount of time a bird wants to spend on there by giving them the type of habitat they need for all different seasons of the year. Brood habitat's huge when it comes to getting the poults. Once they break out of that shell, you, you wanna have some areas on your farm that 
those turkeys can go and hide. I mean, especially when they can't fly yet and they're, I mean, predominantly on the ground. Fire is a great way to promote that. Have a lot of options on your place for those poults to get and to hide, whether it be from nest predators or birds or owls and things like that. You want to make sure you have a lot of good habitat for the poults. So as a landowner, as a gamekeeper, one way you can do that is by management that disturbs the habitat. Let's say you've got a property that's largely all pine, well, you're gonna have to go in, you're gonna have to do something. That may be some areas you do a timber harvest on, heavily in some places and lightly in others, so that even though it's the same tree species growing there, at the ground level, you've created a diversity of different cover types because of the way you've thinned. Maybe it, you come in and you block that property up and you're doing a prescribed burn regimen on a different rotation so that every couple of years touching something differently. And so now that habitat is diverse and sort of all arranged in a way where you've got a lot of diversity across the whole property. You gotta think of things like that. How can I maximize diversity and do it at a scale that's meaningful for turkeys? Closed captioning for gamekeepers is provided by Gunner Kennels. Man's best friend deserves man's best kennel. We invite you to subscribe to the Gamekeepers magazine or pick up a copy at Bass Pro Shops, Tractor Supply, and Walmart. Hey, to take your gamekeeping to the next level with up-to-date news and tips, scan the QR code on the screen. And don't forget to download our all-new GameKeeper podcast. Mr. Fox has really set the example that we're all trying to strive for as far as conservation and protecting these critters that we all love to chase so much. He always asks how you and your family are doing before you get a chance to ask him. Everywhere you go around town and see him, people are saying the same thing. He, he's just an awesome person. Growing up, you know, hearing the almost folklore of Mr. Fox and just all that he's done, the original OG gamekeeper, as a lot of people like to call him. My 71st turkey season, is not, it's been off to a good start and a bad start. So they called a turkey, some turkeys up, and I shot six feet over them. Couldn't figure out what in the world had happened. And about two weeks later, yeah, here comes three long beards, and lo and behold, I do the same thing. This again, except I'm getting closer. I didn't miss him with about six feet. With all of that, I was bound and determined to justify my existence. Daddy called. He said, hey, I'm feeling good. Uh, it's going to be too cold in the morning. But I really want to go. How about Wednesday morning? And I was like, absolutely. The next morning we got up real early, got up probably 30, 45 minutes earlier than usual. Went over to his house, Grant had his little breakfast pack done and a, a baggie of snacks, just like she always does to see him off, gave him a big kiss. I saw that good luck kiss, I was thinking, maybe this is the day. Well, we went and got an early start and went up there and got situated and and got in there and got a good blind by a big fine old oak tree. Daylight came and nothing happened and nothing happened. And I don't think the gobbler's gobbled. And then the next thing we know after about 15, 20 minutes, one of them got close enough that it was kind of on an Indian mound and I still didn't see the turkey. Well, next thing we know things are all silent and the turkey had gone south. If it was just me hunting, or I was hunting with Daniel O'Neill or one of my buddies, we'd probably get up and move. But what happened after that is just kind of a proof to you that sometimes the best thing to kill a turkey is just good, plain old patience. Taxi was still doing his thing, sounding like one turkey, and it sounded like three turkeys, and it sounded like a turkey fight and whatnot. You know, I called, and a turkey got him, and I couldn't course it. I wait, it seemed like forever, but probably, honestly, five, six, seven minutes. I yelled, and a turkey gobbled so close. I was watching, I was watching, and boom, there they came.
you did it, you did it, you did it, you did it. He's a big old longbeard too. You know, this particular turkey, what makes it really special to me is the same little fella I took 50 years ago and put him between my legs and he killed his first turkey. He's the same fella that called that turkey up this time and, and he was as excited about it as I was. Nothing I don't believe can mean any more to anybody than have your children or your grandchildren come along and participate in the things that you love. And so more than anything, that's what this hunt meant to me. The reason I started out, I didn't think I was going to get number 71. I, He's going to shoot up a bunch of trees, but it all held forth and it, we got him in deep freeze. What a relief. This year, I don't know. I, you know, he missed so badly those first two times. He, he literally said something about, man, I guess I just need to quit and it had broken my heart. But I just knew how much joy it was fixing to happen and I couldn't wait to get out there and get my hands on him and get back to daddy. When I got to the turkey and looked back at him, he was just shaking. He was so excited. I'm, I'm Fox Hayes. I've just completed my 71st successful turkey season. And looking forward to a few more as long as I've got my grandchildren holding me up when I go to the woods.